Welcome to Christ Center Community on Upper Caswell Lake. May our time together, learning about God and His expectations of us, be a mighty blessing to you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for sending your Son into the world that we might be in a relationship with you, that we might get to know you, and that we might bring you glory. May we each be receptive vessels to that which you want to bless us with this day from your written word. May the Holy Spirit use this message to help us recognize our prejudices and overcome them knowing we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us and to follow Jesus' example, that is, to be purposeful about revealing to all people that in your eyes, every person is a somebody worthy to receive the living water available through Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Prejudice is defined as damage, especially detrimental to one's rights or claims or an opinion for or against something or someone without adequate basis. It is closed-mindedness or closing off one's heart. It includes extending that closed-mindedness toward one to all people of the same type. We all have prejudices, and it doesn't always come in the form of those that immediately come to mind, like racism or sexism. On the subject of prejudice, American broadcast journalist Edward R. Murrow once said, everyone is a prisoner of his own experience. No one can eliminate prejudices, just recognize them. American author and humorist Mark Twain had this to say, the very ink with which all history is written is merely fluid prejudice. We can all attest to the truth in Mark Twain's statement based on what has transpired in our own lifetime. Prejudice against the poor, those with physical and or mental disabilities, women, persons of a different color, sexual orientation or culture. And the list goes on and on. And the list would be even longer still and tied with a ribbon of blood if we added all the prejudice documented in the annals of American history. But prejudice isn't unique to just American history. It spans all of history around the world as it was in Jesus' day, as is evident in our text for today as we continue on with our walk through the gospel according to John's sermon series, whereby we turn our attention to the woman of Samaria in John 4, verses 7 through 26. But let's first set the stage of today's narrative. Jesus' early ministry in the region of Judea was gaining increasing attention. The growing number of his disciples excited the curiosity of the Pharisees who constituted the ruling religious class. The growth of any messianic movement could easily be interpreted as having political overtones and Jesus did not want to become involved in any outward conflict with the state, whether Jewish or Roman. So in order to avoid a direct clash, he left Judea and journeyed northward to Galilee. Now the shortest route from Jerusalem to Galilee lay on the high road straight through Samaritan territory. Many Jews would not travel by that road, for they regarded any contact with Samaritans as defiling, that is, it would make them unclean, and they had what they considered to be solid ground on which to base their prejudice. For you see, immediately after the fall of the northern kingdom in 722 BC to the Assyrians, the Assyrians deported the Israelites from their land and resettled the northern kingdom with captives from other countries. These persons brought with them their own gods whose worship they had combined with remnants of the worship of Jehovah and Baal into a mongrel-type religion. Thus, when the descendants of the southern kingdom's captivity returned from Babylon in 539 BC to renew their worship under the law, 
they found a complete rift between themselves and the inhabitants of Samaria, both religiously and politically. And by the time of Jesus, a strong rivalry and hatred prevailed. In spite of the prejudice, Jesus purposefully took the shortest route from Jerusalem to Galilee, straight through the Samaritan territory. And while in Samaritan territory around noon, he grew weary and sat down by Jacob's well, which brings us to our text for today. John 4, verses 7 through 26. There came a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Therefore, the Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink since I am a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. She said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? You are not greater than our father Jacob, are you, who gave us the well and drank of it himself and his sons and his cattle? Jesus answered and said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst. But the water that I will give him will become in him a well of water, springing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so I will not be thirsty, nor come all the way here to draw. He said to her, Go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You have correctly said, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband. This you have said truly. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and you people say that in Jerusalem is a place where men ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, An hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming. He who is called Christ. When that one comes, he will declare all things to us. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. There are lots of things in this text that we can chew on and digest. But when reading any biblical text, Two questions should take priority. What does this text tell us about God? And what does this text tell us about his expectations of us, Jesus' disciples of today? In response to those two questions, three principles are readily apparent in our text for today. First, Jesus' purposeful travel route. Second, God's desire to give anybody living water. And third, God's expectation of worshipers. We will begin with Jesus' purposeful travel route. In spite of the prejudice and at the risk of being defiled, Jesus purposefully took the shortest route from Jerusalem to Galilee, straight through Samaritan territory. For it's written in John 4, verse 4, and he had to pass through Samaria. Then, in spite of the fact that the woman was a Samaritan, a member of the hated mixed race, was known to be living in sin and was in a public place unescorted, Jesus purposely t- 
talk to her. Why? Because in the eyes of God, she and the rest of the Samaritans were somebody. They mattered to God. Because as the Savior of all humanity, Jesus had to confront the smoldering suspicion and ill will between Jew and Samaritan by ministering to them. For the gospel is for every person, no matter what his or her race, social position, or past sins. In the eyes of God, every person is a somebody. Every person has been created in the image of God. As disciples of Christ, we must follow Jesus' example. Thereby, we too must purposefully identify and face head-on the prejudice or preconceptions we have been taught by our culture, our parents, our churches, and our experience. We must be prepared to share the gospel at any time and in any place. Jesus crossed all barriers to share the gospel, and we who follow him must do no less. Which brings us to the second principle, readily apparent in our text for today, God's desire to give everybody living water. In verse 10, what did Jesus mean by living water? In his response to the Samaritan woman, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Well, in the Old Testament, many verses speak of thirsting after God as one thirsts for water, water being life-sustaining. For example, consider these words, if you will, in Psalm 42, verse 1. As the deer pants for the water brooks, so my soul pants for you, O God. Or in Isaiah 55, verse 1. Ho! Everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And these words in Jeremiah 2, verse 13. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living water, to hew for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns, that can hold no water. That is, in the light of the Old Testament, a tradition in which the Samaritan woman was familiar Jesus was saying he is the means by which one's thirst for God can be quenched. In other words, he is claiming to be the promised Messiah, for only the Messiah could give the gift that satisfies the soul's desire. Hearing his words but missing his meaning, she questions him further. He responds with these words recorded in verses 13 and 14. Everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst. But the water that I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. So what exactly is the water that Jesus will give? The author John provides the answer to that question in John 7, verse 39. By this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time the Spirit had not been given, since Jesus had not yet been glorified. In his second reply to the Samaritan woman, Jesus contrasts the water in the well and the water he intended to give. The material water would relieve thirst only temporarily. The spiritual water would quench the inner thirst forever. The water in the well had to be drawn up with hard labor, whereas the spiritual water would bubble up from within, becoming in one a well of water springing up to eternal life. Eternal here once again referring to the new life God gives not solely to the duration of existence, but also to the quality of life. It is a deepening and growing experience, changing us on the inside and empowering us to deal with life's challenges through God's perspective. 
challenging us to see past our prejudices to doing the will of God. Which brings us to the third principle readily apparent in our text for today, God's expectation of worshipers. Verses 23 and 24 of our text for today provides not only God's definition of true worshipers, but God's expectation that we be true worshipers. But an hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. True worship is that of the spirit, which means that the worshiper must deal honestly and openly with God. We cannot fool God. We cannot hide our thoughts or prejudices from God, nor can we hide our real motives from God. We might not always know what our motives are, but God does. As such, why not deal honestly and openly with God and allow the Holy Spirit to bubble up within us to renew our minds and to remove and replace our stony hearts of sin with soft, pliable hearts of love. Overall, our text for today reveals that in the eyes of God, every person matters, and he longs to give every person living water that they might become true worshipers, worshiping God in spirit and truth. That is, in the eyes of God, every person is somebody. It doesn't matter how you are viewed by others or how you view yourself. You matter to God. And as disciples of Christ, we too must look past our prejudices or preconceived notions and purposefully make the good news available to everyone. Those prejudices might be as obvious as racial bias or as subtle as woundedness from our past that clouds the way we see others. So the question I leave you with to prayerfully consider today and in the coming week is, what prejudice or prejudices do you have that are acting as barriers to you fulfilling the role you've been assigned in God's plan to redeem the world he loves? Barriers to you reaching out and telling others about Jesus. And for those who have not yet asked Jesus to be your Savior, the question I leave you with to consider today and in the coming week is, are you not somebody? If so, then step up to the well. You qualify for his water. All ages are welcome. Both genders are invited. No race is excluded. No sin too great. All are welcome. You don't have to be rich to drink, religious to drink, successful to drink. You simply need to follow the instructions on what? or better still, who to drink. That is Jesus. In order for Jesus to do what water does, you must let him penetrate your heart deep, deep inside. Eternalize him, ingest him, welcome him into the inner workings of your life. Let Christ be the water of your soul. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as disciples of your Son, please open our eyes to our prejudices and preconceived notions that are standing in the way of obedience that we might confess and repent and turn away from them. Help us see every person through your eyes as a somebody, as created in your image. May from our innermost being flow rivers of living water that we might bring you glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. Hopefully you can join us again next week for the next part of our Walk Through the Gospel According to John sermon series. When God calls you home, may Jesus greet you with, Well done, my good and faithful servant. Thank you.